Hello. A while back in video three, I definitively proved the negation of Fermat's last theorem. No three positive integers, a, b, and c, can satisfy the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for any positive integer value of n greater than two. Or conversely, I proved Johnson's theorem. Johnson's theorem states, some three positive integers, a, b, and c, may satisfy the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for any positive integer value of n greater than two if integers a, b, and c obey Euclid's formula. I prove the negation by providing an exquisitely simple margin proof based upon the fact that a quaternion is a natural log and as such must obey all the rules pertaining to exponents or natural logs, specifically the natural log rule of exponents, where the natural log of y to the x is equal to x times the natural log of y. Now I'm fairly certain many of you either rejected the proof outright or decided to just bypass it and see what happens with it in the future since it challenges the canonical proof of whiles. Well, recently I came across a mythology video entitled Reinventing the Magic Log Wheel. How was this missed for 400 years? Links are in the description below. After viewing this video, I just couldn't help but add more proof to my side of the ledger. I've taken excerpts from the video to demonstrate just how true and beautiful the quaternion as log proof is. If this video doesn't convince you, then I don't know what will. So first let's see what mythologist Burkhard Polster has to say about the circular slide rule. Okay, here's the simple setup. We start with a wheel and a rubber band that's labeled with the numbers from 0 to 10. The zero end of the rubber band is fixed to a wall and the 10 end is fixed to the top of the wheel. Now start spinning the wheel in the clockwise direction. Watch what happens. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so the rubber band wraps around the wheel and it does so without slipping. As a consequence, the numbers spread out more and more along the wheel. All clear? Great. Let's keep on spinning. There, there. Okay, so far we've just dealt with the integers from 1 to 10, but of course there are other numbers in between those integers. In particular, let's highlight the tens decimal fractions there. Now, the inventor of the wheel chose the wheel to be of just the right size, so that after one revolution, the 1 will end up in exactly the same spot as the 10. Watch. Okay. So far, for our purposes, the take home message is this. On the circular slide rule, the spacing between the integers increases, but not the value of the integers themselves. Okay, let's continue. Now, can you see where all those zero point numbers go when we rotate the wheel a second time? Well, obviously in the same spots as 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10. Give the wheel another spin, so more stretching, and you end up here, and so on. What all this shows is that all numbers that just differ in the positions of their decimal points end up in exactly the same spot on the wheel. Okay, as I said, green over black is the same as red over blue. 3 over 1, well, that's just 3. Now solve for the red number. So green times blue equals red, always. Now, to finish off, the wheel of logarithms that inspired this video was invented by Dmitry Zagalovsky, who is a software engineer and entrepreneur based in New York City, and who in his spare time is also one of the directors of the New York Math Circle. Here then is Dmitry's original post on Reddit, as well as the wheel the way he presented it.
Okay, I'm sure the clue among you are going log, 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 log on. Yes, yes, pre-rubber band. Any proper discussion of slide rules would have been built around the properties of logarithms. So to finish off, let me also quickly show you where logarithms are hiding in our magic scales. Let's say the original rubber band is one unit long. Then a little bit of calculus shows that the wheel has a circumference equal to the natural logarithm of 10. Well, maybe one of you math demons can supply a proof in the comments. Hmm. All of you non-demons who don't breathe logarithms, just relax and go with the flow. We're almost there. Anyway, in general, the clockwise distance along the wheel between the one at the top and one of the numbers from 1 to 10 is the natural logarithm of that number. For example, the distance between 1 and 2 is equal to the natural logarithm of 2. And the distance between 1 and 3 is equal to the natural logarithm of 3. Let's highlight this distance on the second scale. Okay, There, that blue distance is equal to the natural logarithm of 3. Now, we want to multiply 2 times 3. Remember how that works? Just rotate the green 2 to the top. From earlier, we also know that 2 times 3 equals 6 is opposite the blue 3. Yep, there it is. Now the distance from the outer 1 to the 6 is the natural logarithm of 6. But that red distance is also green plus blue. And so log 2 plus log 3 is equal to log 6. Or log 2 plus log 3 is equal to log of 2 times 3. There you have it. The magic of the slide rule illuminated from a different angle, right? The sum of the logarithms of two numbers is the logarithm of the product of the two numbers. And so from the logarithmic point of view, what the slide rule does is to translate the complicated operation of multiplying two numbers into the much simpler operation of adding two numbers. And so with our grateful thanks to Mythologer, and Sagalowski's insightful interpretation of the circular slide rule, let's now take what we have learned about the circular slide rule based on logarithms and apply it to the quaternion. Pulse first says, but that red distance is also green plus blue. Paraphrasing, we may say, the red arc, which is by definition a quaternion, is the sum of the green arc plus the blue arc, which is equal to the product of the green arc times the blue arc. And since Polster has defined these various colored arcs as being natural logs, then quaternions are therefore natural logs and therefore must obey the rules of natural logs. I have now exhaustively proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the quaternion is a natural log and therefore must obey all the rules of natural logs. 
and therefore must obey all the rules of the circular slide rule. And so armed with this new insight, let's once again prove the negation of Fermat's last theorem. Once again, we establish that a natural log is an arc length and that by definition, an arc length is a quaternion. Therefore, a quaternion is a natural log and must obey all the rules of natural logs. Now the rules of natural logs says that the sum of two natural logs is equal to their product. So let's say we wish to multiply the natural log of two times the natural log of three. Well, as expected, the circular slide rule yields a product of natural log of six. If we add the actual length of the arc made by the natural log of two to the actual length of the arc made by the natural log of three, they form a total arc length that equals the red arc length of natural log of six. And so the sum of natural log of two plus natural log of three equals both their sum and their product. And so we once again definitively prove that quaternions as arc lengths obey the rules of natural logs. And if that is the case, then the sum of the natural log of two plus the sum of natural log of three must also equal natural log of five since the law of exponents allows us to add exponents. And this is indeed the case given our circular slide rule. But the rules of exponents says that we may add powers of exponents. Therefore, if the natural log of two plus the natural log of three equals natural log of five, then it must also be true that the natural log of two raised to the power of four plus the natural log of three raised to a power of four is equal to the natural log of five raised to a power of four. And so by any number of rules, such as the rule of exponents, where the natural log of x raised to the power y is equal to y times the natural log of x, or the Marvel formula, or Quick's power rule, where q to the n equals nq, we may write as natural logs or quaternion integers, two to the fourth power plus three to the fourth power equals five to the fourth power equals four times two plus four times three equals four times five equals eight plus 12 equals 20. Fermat's last theorem states, no three positive integers, a, b, and c can satisfy the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for any positive integer value of n greater than two. However, as we have just demonstrated by the rules of exponents, where the natural log of x raised to the power of y is equal y times the natural log of x, two to the fourth plus three to the fourth equals five to the fourth equals four times two plus four times three equals four times five equals eight plus 12 equals 20. Therefore, if the quaternions a, b, and c equal the integers two, three, and five respectively, each being raised to a power of n equals four, then using the rules of exponents applied to the quaternions, which are themselves by definition arc lengths and therefore natural logs, then the quaternion is equal to a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c to the fourth equals two to the fourth plus three to the fourth equals five to the fourth equals four times two plus four times three equals four times five equals eight plus 12 equals 20. Therefore, Fermat's last theorem is false and thus negated. It is given that the circular slide rule may and does compute the ratio of any type of number whatsoever, integer, fraction, irrational, transcendental, real, or complex. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. This job is to solely maintain a universe of constant ratios. It doesn't care what is being ratioed, only that it may be expressed as a ratio and that ratio is maintained throughout any and all revolutions of the circle. Therefore, since the circular slide rule may accommodate all numbers, then all numbers may be considered as natural logs and therefore all numbers may be considered as quaternions. Therefore, all integers are quaternions. Therefore, all primes are quaternions. But if both integers and primes may be considered as unit quaternions, then what distinguishes the two? The fundamental theorem of arithmetic states, every integer greater than one is a prime or a unique factorization of primes. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic definitively establishes the difference between primes and integers. The integer one is defined as not being prime. 
Primes are the building blocks of integers. All integers are built from primes. All primes exist as an independent unit, divisible by only one and itself. All primes except two are odd. At this stage, the alarm bell should be going off in your head. Now, if all integers are built from primes, then all quaternions as integers are built from primes, which means all quaternions as integers must obey the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. But we know the ultimate all-encompassing formula of quaternions is Euler's formula. So somehow, some way, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is an alternative expression of Euler's formula. If you have become comfortable with the pervasiveness and omnipresence of Euler's formula, then this revelation should come as no shock to you. We have proven that the fundamental theorem of calculus is an expression of Euler's formula, that the fundamental theorem of algebra is an expression of Euler's formula, that the marvelous formula is an expression of Newtonian calculus and quick, both of which are expressions of Euler's formula. What we realize is that any fundamental expression of mathematics will and must have an Euler's formula analog if that fundamental expression is to be expressed within or upon the plus or minus one unit spheres. The circular slide rule is simply two unit circles acting as space and body centroids. The circular slide rule reconfirms once again a fundamental Quickian principle. There is no infinity. There is only plus or minus one, plus or minus one half, plus or minus zero, periodic two pi radian overlap, and the numbers that fall between these boundaries, which means we may sum the entirety of integers by winding the sum around the circular slide rule circumference, which would place us right back at zero. And so from this one simple but seismic proposition, we can state that the sum of all the positive integers is and must be one or all of the following, plus or minus one, plus or minus one half, plus or minus zero. Now, of course, you will say, impossible. It just can't be that simple. Yet time and time again, I have demonstrated that the power quick thrives in turning the seemingly once complicated into the elegantly simple. To those of you with a more broader math background, this quickian logarithmic solution immediately challenges Ramanujan's famous solution of negative one over 12. Now faced with the impressive weight of Ramanujan's solution and a good healthy dose of skepticism from my audience, let's see if I can more formally prove the quickian solution that the sum of all the integers is equal to plus or minus one, plus or minus one and a half, plus or minus zero. First, I'm going to introduce you to some of the remarkable work of Grant Sanderson, Pi Hiding in Prime Regularities. You will find no better explanation of Gaussian integers on the internet. Links are in the description below. But for right now, I want you to fully grasp the following concepts. There exists not one, but two types of integers, integers and Gaussian integers. There exists two types of primes, primes and Gaussian primes. Some primes may be split into two Gaussian primes. The entirety of the number line may be expressed along the circumference of the circular slide rule. Therefore, the circular slide rule, or set of unit circles, must account for all of the four different types of integers. All Gaussian integers are hypotenuses, and therefore tangents, and therefore derivatives, and therefore quaternions, and therefore natural logs. To account for these different types of integers, let's start once again with Zagalowski's rubber band model of the circular slide rule. In studying the rubber band model of the circular slide rule, we notice a curious effect. As the rubber band wraps around the wheel, the distance between the units gets progressively wider. In this case, we will allow the units to be integers. Therefore, the distance gets progressively wider, reaching a maximum between integers one and two before the cycle repeats. It is important to note the following. Since the value of each unit remains constant throughout, then so too must the value of the spacing separating them. Therefore, no matter the distance that exists between each integer, any and all such distances must always represent 
an absolute value of one. Using this approach, we see that the concept of an integer takes on a whole new interpretation. Instead of measuring magnitude, it becomes a signpost for the location of some distance existing between some two integers. Thus, one, 10, and 100 all represent an absolute value of one, but their locations on the number line vary. This particular set of integers share the property that they periodically appear every two pi radians. Even though all three are equivalent to one another, they are unique in that they have unique locations. Now armed with these rudimentary concepts, the Riemann zeta function, and proof of the Riemann hypothesis, I now present a formal detailed proof that the sum of all the positive integers is one. Let's go through the proof step by step. Sanderson provides us with an excellent introduction into Gaussian integers. Some of the major points are, every Gaussian integer is a single point. Every Gaussian integer is a single complex number characterized by the intersection of X and IY, whereas a complex number A plus BI. Every Gaussian integer is and must be a hypotenuse or tangent. Given the Pythagorean theorem and the sum square root of 2 plus square root of 3 equals square root of 5, then Gaussian integers sum just like regular integers sum. So the Gaussian integer as hypotenuse or tangent must be the hypotenuse of a pseudo-Pythagorean triple since its sides are composed of the square root of integers. Now I say pseudo-Pythagorean triple because the sides of these Gaussian triples or the square roots of integers, whereas the size of a Pythagorean triple or integers or squared Gaussian integers. Every Gaussian integer can be considered as a radius that extends from the center of the unit circle. And since it is a radius of a unit circle, it must therefore be equivalent to an absolute value of one. Every Gaussian integer may be expressed as the square root of some integer, but since all integers may be characterized as the square root of a square, then all integers are necessarily Gaussian integers, which again confirms that Gaussian integers sum equivalently to regular integers. If we rotate any Gaussian radius around the entire unit circle, it either will or will not intersect some Gaussian integer at its tip along the circumference. Sanderson establishes that the square root of primes that are one above a multiple of four for example, 5 or 13 or 17 may be further factored into exactly two Gaussian primes. So again, there are some regular integer primes, like 5, that are not primes in the Gaussian world. They can be split into two other Gaussian primes. He also establishes that the square root of primes that are 3 above a multiple of 4, for instance 3 or 7 or 11, cannot be further factored into any other primes. And so there are some regular integer primes like three that are primes no matter what integer world you find them in. These square root of primes that are three above a multiple of four, for example, three, seven, or 11, are called Gaussian primes. The square root of n radii of Gaussian primes that are three or three above a multiple of four, for example, three, seven, or 11, intercept exactly zero Gaussian integers when rotated two pi radians. So a spinning radius of square root of five would intercept several lattice points along the circumference, whereas a spinning radius of square root of three would intercept no lattice points along the circumference. The Riemann zeta function, where s equals negative one half, produces an infinite summation of Gaussian integers, starting with the square root of one and ending with whatever the final Gaussian integer will be. But take a good look at this list of Gaussian integers we began to notice a very curious pattern. The square root of one 
is one. So we have one plus the square root of two plus the square root of three plus the square root of four. But the square root of four is two. So now we have one plus the square root of two plus the square root of three plus two plus the square root of five plus the square root of six plus the square root of seven plus the square root of eight plus the square root of nine. But the square root of nine equals three. And the pattern repeats on and on and on. And so what we see emerging is a summation of integers, every integer pair being separated by some grouping of Gaussian integers. To better see what is happening, the integers and grouping of Gaussian integers have been separated into individual lines. Each grouping of Gaussian integers is called the parenthetical statement. Each line is composed of an inline integer and a parenthetical statement. Every parenthetical statement is comprised of twice the number of inline integer Gaussian integers. So an inline integer of one will have two Gaussian integers in its parenthetical statement. An inline integer of a million will have two million Gaussian integers in its parenthetical statement. Every parenthetical statement will contain an inline integer number of arguments. Every argument contains two Gaussian integers one being odd, the other being even. Therefore, the inline integer of one has one parenthetical statement consisting of one argument, that argument being comprised of the even Gaussian integer, square root of two, and the odd Gaussian integer, square root of three. Now, so far, in every proof I have presented, I always point out that one all-important key that is the basis for solving the problem. In this particular proof, the key turns out to be that every parenthetical statement must satisfy two conditions. The first condition is, every parenthetical statement must sum to an absolute value of one in order to maintain proper logarithmic spacing. The second condition is, the sum of every parenthetical statement will always obtain a Gaussian integer value of square root of n, where n is some prime or integer multiple thereof. That is one above a multiple of four, for example, five or 13 or 17. Now the first question you probably have is, wait a minute, where did this absolute value of one come from? Well, keep in mind we are summing integers and parenthetical statements. And even though we may or may not know what the sum of a parenthetical statement may be, what we do know for sure is that these parenthetical statements always span the space between two consecutive integers. And the difference between any two consecutive integers is always one. So since each parenthetical statement always occupies that space between integers, then it must always equal an absolute value of one. Which probably leads you to your next question. But how do you sum the sides to get one? We know no matter how you add them, as integers or as irrationals or as size of a right triangle, the square root of two plus the square root of three does not equal one, but not so fast. Remember, many of the Gaussian integer radii intersect lattice points when being rotated, which means these points of intersection lie along the circumference, which makes these points quaternions, which makes them arc lengths, which makes them natural logs. Even for those Gaussian integers that do not intercept lattice points, such as the square root of three, they still nonetheless intercept an infinite number of points that lie along the circumference, with those points necessarily being quaternions. And since the circular slide rule accommodates any and all numbers, and since Gaussian integers sum as do regular integers, then their spacing requirements along the circumference as square root of n squared integers will be the same as those of integers along the circumference. And so we repeat once again, since the value of each unit remains constant throughout, then so too must the value of the spacing separating them. Therefore, no matter the distance that exists between each integer or the square root of n squared type, any and all such distances must always represent an absolute value of one. Every parenthetical statement contains an inline integer number of bracketed arguments. Every argument contains two Gaussian integers, one even and one odd. The odd Gaussian integer is a, the even Gaussian integer is bi. This must be the case since i equals negative one half. 
If Gaussian integers are considered as being equivalent to integers of the square root of n squared type, then each of these two Gaussian integers represent the side and base of a pseudo-Pythagorean triple. Therefore, every argument is the hypotenuse of a pseudo-Pythagorean triple, since the sum of the sides equal the hypotenuse. Therefore, every argument is a tangent, which is a derivative, which is a quaternion, which is an arc length, which is a natural log, which is e to the x, which is Euler's formula. And since the sum of very parenthetical statement must always obtain a Gaussian integer value of square root of n, where n is some prime, or integer multiple thereof, that is one above a multiple of four, for example, five, 13, or 17, then we obtain a value of square root of five in line A and square root of two times 13 in line B. Therefore, we may sum all the odd sides of all the pseudo-Pythagorean triple arguments to form a composite base and all of the even sides of all the pseudo-Pythagorean triple arguments to form a composite height. The sum of all the Gaussian integers equals the sum of all the arguments, which results in the formation of a final single composite parenthetical statement. This would then yield a hypotenuse that would be the sum of all the Gaussian integers. Therefore, such a hypotenuse constitutes a radius that spans the unit circle and as such must equal one. This satisfies the condition that every parenthetical statement must sum to an absolute value of one to maintain proper logarithmic spacing. But since Gaussian integers sum identically to integers, then such a hypotenuse would also be equal to the sum of all the integers. Alternatively, squaring the final parenthetical statement sum results in producing an integer, i sub total, which is the total sum of all integers, which equals one squared, which equals one. Therefore, it is proven that the sum of all the integers equals the zeta function, where s equals negative one half. Therefore, zeta sub negative one half equals one. And there you have it, the summation of the integers. Now granted, this is one of the longest proofs I have presented so far, but it is still remarkably concise and precise. But having derived this proof, a corollary immediately follows. Let's go through this corollary step by step. It must be the case that if the sum of the Gaussian integers is one, and the sum of the integers is one, then the sum of both types of integers is two. But the circular slide rules allows us to restrict the integers to one will and the Gaussian integers to the opposing will. Now expressed in the language of quick, let's consider the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. The Gaussian integers would therefore occupy the circumference of the body centroid. The integers would occupy the one half size diminished space centroid. Since the centroids are opposing, then we may allow the positive integers to occupy one circumference and the negative integers to occupy the other, where each negative integer is a parenthetical statement. Therefore, the common point of tangency is always equivalent to the limit and therefore the derivative and therefore is equal to zero. Therefore, since the distance around the circumference represents the sum of all the integers occupying that circumference, then the sum of all types of integers equals zero. Therefore, we can say that the sum of all the integers is one, the sum of all the Gaussian integers is negative one, and the sum of all types of integers is zero. But through the Riemann hypothesis, we prove that this sum of zero is a summation of zeros that lie along the y-axis of the space central, which yields a non-trivial zero, which we also proved is equivalent to i, which is equal to the square root of negative one, which is equivalent to negative one half, which is equivalent to two, which leads us right back to our opening statement. If the sum of the Gaussian integers is one and the sum of the integers is one, then the sum of both types of integers is two. The Gaussian integers may also represent one since by condition one of the proof, every parenthetical statement must sum to an absolute value of one in order to maintain proper logarithmic spacing. The existence of the Gaussian integers and the integers is due to the existence of the square root of one is equal to the square root of one squared. The existence of positive and negative integers is due to the existence of square root of one equals plus or minus one, which confirms that every parenthetical statement must sum to an absolute value of one in order to maintain proper logarithmic spacing. 
This is further confirmed by the following equation. which is also the basis for a set of spiraling right triangles. Also, it was earlier stated that the circular slide rule is the space and body centroids of the Riemann hypothesis. The two centroids assume a two to one ratio with the space centroid being half the diameter and therefore half the circumference of the body centroid. Therefore, the body centroids resident quaternions assume the state of being half points and those half points manifest as the Gaussian integers Square root of n equals n to the one half, which is equivalent to one half n, which is equivalent to a half, which reconfirms our earlier proof of the Collatz conjecture. And as demonstrated by the equation, it therefore follows that if the integral f of x equals the sum of n over two, which equals one, then the sum of n over two equals one, must also equal the sum of the square root of n, which equals the sum of n to the one half, which is equivalent to the sum of one half n, which is equivalent to the sum of the halves. Given our new insight into the Gaussian integers, we may now restate the solution to the Collatz conjecture. Therefore, it is proven that the sum of all the integers is equal to zeta sub negative one half is equal to plus or minus one, which is equivalent to plus or minus one half, which is equivalent to plus or minus zero. And if S equals plus or minus one half, which is equivalent to plus or minus zero, which is equivalent to plus or minus one, then it must be the case that the equivalent expressions of S and the Riemann zeta function must yield equivalent results. Therefore, we obtain the following equation of equivalency. Earlier I stated that somehow, some way, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic had to be an alternative expression of Euler's formula, and we find that this is indeed the case. Every parenthetical statement is a Gaussian integer version of its inline integer. That is, every parenthetical statement always sums to its inline integer, and every integer and parenthetical statement represents a constant logarithmic spacing of one. Where well, we have so far characterized the Gaussian integer as being the stretchable logarithmic space spanning the distance between any two consecutive integers, it is just as valid to declare the parenthetical statements as being static in value and the integers themselves as acting as the increasing stretchable logarithmic space that stretches around the circumference. Therefore, where the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says, that every integer is a prime or a unique factorization of primes, the Eulerian interpretation says, every integer, no matter its type, is a unique summation of Gaussian integers. Every parenthetical statement must sum to an absolute value of one in order to maintain proper logarithmic spacing. The sum of every parenthetical statement will always obtain a Gaussian integer value of square root of n, where n is some prime or an integer multiple thereof that is one above a multiple of four, for example, five or 13 or 17. It is this third statement that is the Eulerian expression of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It is important to note that it is a unique summation of primes, not Gaussian primes, from which the integers are built, even though it is the Gaussian primes that are the most fundamental. Recall that Gaussian primes cannot be split into any other Gaussian integers and that they interact with no other lattice points when being rotated. Therefore, Gaussian primes ostensibly defy the logarithmic spacing requirement and are thus unsuitable for the construction of integers. Therefore, primes form the basis of rationality. However, we face a conundrum. In the circular slide rule, every parenthetical statement must sum the one. But it is also true that every parenthetical statement represents a constant spacing of one over 10, which makes it a unit fraction. Therefore, every Gaussian integer of the parenthetical statement must also act as a unit fraction since their sum must form a unit fraction. An Egyptian unit fraction may be defined by the following equations. Therefore, 
if 1 over q is equal to the square root of 3, then a Gaussian prime can indeed be split into two other fractions. One may argue that the Egyptian fraction formula was structured such that an integer would always form the denominator of the fraction. But as we have shown, Gaussian integers behave equivalently to regular integers. So a logical conclusion would be that Gaussian primes are the foundation of irrationality. However, this has yet to be proven. We must, however, be very careful in our zeal to make all things rational within the unit circle. We may hastily and disastrously try to discard all that is irrational which is absolutely forbidden within the confines of the quickian plus or minus one unit spheres. In quick, irrationality is not some mathematical troll. It is not an annoyance or a curse. In quick, we actually need irrationality. Irrationality imposes the status of being a unit quaternion in his own right. Given the universal fungibility of quaternions, without the presence of irrationality, all the quaternions would simply mix themselves into an indistinguishable mush of average. The Pythagoras comma proves to be a musical necessity. All objects vibrating at the same frequency would be a physical disaster. We need something to stir things up, to break the pattern, something to stay above the fray, like a general who stays well away from the battlefield, but yet effectively directs his troops. This numerical separability is displayed by numbers such as the primes, for example, five, the Gaussian primes, for example, the square root of three, the irrationals, for example, square root of two, and the transcendentals, for example, pi. The irrational constants such as i and the square root of two and e and pi all act like chemical catalysts. They participate in an interaction, but they don't become a reactant. They mix but remain unchanged. Indeed, we shall explore this very nature of chemical catalysts in future videos. Rationality allows for quaternion fungibility, but irrationality allows for the unit quaternion to act independently. Apart from the fungibility of quaternions, we also see the reciprocity of quaternions. Again, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and since there is and must be rationality, then there must exist this conjugate irrationality. Every argument is an expression of Euler's formula where the odd Gaussian integer represents minus cosine theta and the even Gaussian integer represents var epsilon sine theta. The two combine to form the integer e to the i theta and all the arguments sum to form the final integer, which brings us back full circle and proves that all integers are quaternions. Now finally, we must address one glaring question. We have just proven that the sum of all the integers is equal to 1, but the great mathematician Ramanujan found the sum of all the integers is equal to negative 1 over 12. Now, how do we reconcile these two different results? Well, the short answer is we don't. We have stated repeatedly that quick does not repress or obviate other algebras or other number systems. Ramanujan's solution may be a perfectly valid solution within whatever number system he was working within. Quick makes no statement one way or the other as to the validity of his solution. Quick can only state what is valid in its working system, and in its working system of the plus or minus one unit spheres, then the Quickian result that the sum of all the integers equal one has demonstrably and exhaustively been proven to be true.